Blessings, good evening. The Buddha encouraged anyone, whether Sangha or lay person who wants to train their mind in meditation, such as Anapanasati or any of the other methods, to go and find a quiet place. He suggested the forest, the countryside, a cave, a hilltop, uh, an empty house, uh, an open space, like a field or a park, and a few other places, but the idea was he was encouraged people to find quiet places to meditate. It's not always possible in life. We're lucky in here, here in Australia. We have a lot of space and not so many people. So it's not that hard to find places to meditate in Australia, I would say. <laughs> but... There are other reasons that the Buddha also encouraged us to go out, say, to the forest to meditate or an empty house. And you think about it, often these places, because they're quiet and lonely and maybe unfamiliar, you're a little bit on guard, aren't you? <clears throat> like monks, we live in the forest. You're always a little bit on guard in the forest because it's nature. You're amongst trees and animals and insects and the things of nature. In the way of urban areas, cities and towns, we tend to try and control nature as much as possible. We build roads and houses and try to control the environment and in our houses we control the temperature and protect ourselves from any kind of pests or dangerous animals or whatever. There's a lot more control going on, whereas in nature it's pretty nat. It's, by its na we say natural. Um, there's a lot of unpredictability. What can go on? The weather is unpredictable, and certainly animals, insects, and things are unpredictable. So that keeps you on your guard, and that can be quite healthy for training the mind. <clears throat> Everyone complains when you meditate. At home, it's so easy to fall asleep, become lazy, become distracted. Because <laughs> you're in a comfortable environment or an environment you've set up to be as comfortable as possible. It's still good to learn to meditate at home, um, but it's challenging in that way. So sometimes it's useful for us to get out of the home when we can and go to quiet places, parks, the countryside, the forest. Because it forces us to kind of up our game a bit, try harder, be more alert. And you know, most forest monks will have their story of when they've been in the forest and encountered a snake or some kind of wild animal or just insects that are at the very least just annoying and <laughs> sometimes painful. Or going somewhere that was reputed to be haunted, all this kind of thing. And they'll say, well, when you're in those places, you're much more alert to what's going on around you because there's a, you know, there's a heightened awareness of danger, risk. Sometimes we say things like, there's something in the air. <laughs> So your mind is a bit more alert. It's hard to fall asleep if you think 
you know, a tiger is going to walk around the corner or a deadly poisonous snake is going to crawl up your leg. <laughs> uh, or even if uh, there's none of those things, but you know, you, you're in a place where they say mosquitoes and those mosquitoes may or may not be carrying some disease like malaria or dengue fever so every time you see or hear a mosquito you're a bit on edge or if you are brought up with a belief in ghosts that can be uh, <laughs> very worrying and keep you awake literally keep you awake at night Whether you actually meet these things or not, it's another question. But just the, the possibility already gets the heart pumping, the adrenaline comes out, and you're, you're much more awake. But that can be quite good for meditation. Kind of makes you have to pay attention to your mind, become more aware of your body, where you are, what you're doing. So this is why the Buddha and other teachers encouraged monks and lay people to try out these things when you're ready of course <laughs> not always you're not always ready to go to the jungle or to the the graveyard but if you are feeling more a little braver and more competent in your meditation well it's something that people try out when i was a novice monk i was living in a monastery right on the edge of Thailand near the Laotian border and the villagers in that area had a problem they had a lot of <laughs> dead bodies they had there was a certain amount of um, crime and also very little government involvement in the area and there's even little skirmishes between uh, militias and army on the border with Laos and Cambodia so bod dead bodies would turn up in the nearby villages sometimes and they wouldn't know what to do with them. Dead bodies and with no relatives and no one to collect them. So they would sometimes bring them t to the forest monastery and deposit them in shallow graves, open graves. There wouldn't be a cremation, they wouldn't bury them, they just place them in these sort of shallow pits. And then the monks and me, I was a novice monk, we had the opportunity to go and sit and meditate by them. I'm being from London, UK, and it wasn't brought up with any fear of ghosts, but still, if you're spending a while or even the whole night next to a dead body, <laughs> the thought does cross your mind. I think it'd be unusual if you didn't have the thought I, is, is there a ghost around? Is there any, any, anything connected to this body now floating around? And the Thai monks I was living with, there's only a, a couple of them and they're very young, but they were petrified, much more than me, petrified of ghosts. And my friend who uh, was staying in the monastery, he tried to bring up a lot of courage. The, one, one day they brought in one of these bodies and deposited it in, in a shallow grave and he said, I'm going to go and meditate next to this body all night. The next morning I met him and he was sort of looking very uh, defeated and he said, oh, I managed till midnight and then I was just so scared. I had to go back to my hut. For some people, just staying in a hut in the forest is already difficult enough. But if you're meditating next to a, a corpse, then you know a hut suddenly seems quite desirable. <laughs> so everything is relative, isn't it? It's, you know, the, the, the amount of suffering you have in one place may see makes somewhere else that you didn't suffer so much, but you had a little bit of suffering. But it makes it seem much more attractive. So the thought of ghosts keeps people up all night sometimes. But that can be quite good for meditation. You keep watching your mind and investigating you. What is this fear that is making me stay awake, you know, that affects my body? Because it's basically your mind is 
affecting your body, your heart beats and your hormones change and you sort of tense up and you can't sleep, even if you want to sleep, you can't sleep. You're looking into that, asking yourself, oh, why does this happen? Where does it come from? And more often than not, you don't actually see a ghost. So then it really is just, this is internal. This is my mind, my imagination, creating something out of this situation. And you get maybe get a chance to see a lot of thoughts that come and go that in other situations may normally have prompted fear, but now you've got nowhere to run, nowhere to go to if you you're in that situation and you decided you're going to meditate through it. And so you're making your mind stronger. Your mindfulness, your awareness becomes stronger and you learn things. You learn that thoughts and emotions are temporary. They rise, they pass away. And on, this is the way you overcome suffering. And this is one kind of suffering. So you might say the suffering of fear. But how do you overcome f fear? Well, by establishing awareness and seeing that fear is impermanent. It rises, it ceases. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very strong, very physical, as well as emotional, very mental. And sometimes it's just mental, just a few thoughts. But it's always changing, it's not certain, it's not fixed. If you go back to your basic awareness that you're practicing, the kind of meditation you may have practiced before you go to <laughs> stay next to the corpse, I wouldn't recommend a complete beginner going there. But if you've been meditating for a while, you've learned to bring up this awareness and turn your attention inwards already. You have a foundation in that and then you go and do it. Well, maybe you really learn something about how fear is a, a condition of mind, a sankhara that's not permanent and it's not a self, it's not really you. It's more like a visitor to the mind, it comes and it goes and when it's there it's unpleasant of course. But if you're strong enough and patient enough you watch it and maybe it disappears right in front of your own eyes. That's where people get insights. You call that an insight into dukkha because you know, fear is obviously suffering, it's not a pleasant thing, whatever the cause of it. You know, if you're living in a city, an ordinary sort of situation where you may have fear of strangers, the dark, maybe a fear of a person at work who you find threatening or difficult, fear of different situations, fear of meeting people, fear of what other people think, all kinds of other fears we have in life. But it's the same principle that you're learning to establish awareness and see fear as a sankhara, a condition of mind that arises and ceases. And trying to establish this awareness and keep it going long enough so that you can see fear as impermanent in that situation. And this is how you learn. You know. We say dukkha is our best teacher. Ajahn Chah used to say everything is our teacher. Of course it is. But dukkha is your best teacher because nobody likes suffering. What we tend to do when we experience any suffering, whether it's just a little bit of pain or mental unhappiness, we try to run away from it, distract ourselves from it, go to sleep, find something to look at, find somebody to talk to, find something or other to occupy our mind so we don't have to deal with or face up to the dukkha. But the way of the Buddha is actually to establish mindfulness, clear comprehension, then look at whatever is happening, including different kinds of dukkha, including fear. Get to know it as it is, rather than just be a kind of a, always reacting to it or be a slave to it and just react with this fear. Usually you try to run away from the fear or to block it out. 
and fear, of course, sometimes it's telling you something. It's not like you should never run away. If you're in a dangerous situation, well, sometimes your fear is saying run away, and that is the best thing to do, of course. But we have a lot of fears come up in more ordinary situations as well, just habits of mind, sometimes without much basis. But whatever, fear is suffering. And the purpose of the Buddhist teachings is to give us ways and means to overcome suffering. And in the end we have to establish enough awareness that we can see suffering as suffering, see the fear as suffering and let go. Back to that phrase we use all the time, letting go. But how do you let go? Well, by knowing something as it is. You let go of whatever your delusion is or that forms around that thing. So if... In the case of fear, you are knowing that fear is impermanent, say. When fear has power over you, it's because you are seeing yourself in that fear. You say, this is me, I am afraid. You believe it, you are attached to it. And it's one of the strongest emotions, so of course it's, it is challenging. But at the same time, many meditators, men and women, have overcome fear over the years it can be abandoned but we have to establish awareness and look at it rather than run away from it much of our practice is like this we you know we we always take the easy way out if we're honest as human beings we love our comforts we love happiness pleasure distraction and to be honest, if, if we look at it carefully, you know, much of the pleasure and the distraction and the comforts that we are so addicted to and used to, they kind of make our mind go a bit weak and floppy. <laughs> they don't make us smart, they make us more stupid or more ignorant. Because we're not realising the truth when we get attached to happiness. We think, oh, I've got what I want now. So the mind kind of goes to sleep. Again, if you go out to a quiet place that's not your normal space, your normal safe space, say like your home or something like that, you go out to somewhere that's not your home, the park or the countryside or the forest or the graveyard, you go to these places, you know, it brings you out of your comfort zone. So we don't like it. We don't like the challenge. And that's why there's so few enlightened people in the world. Because <laughs> really, honestly, we don't like to face up to some of our deeper attachments. We just try to minimize them, avoid them, distract ourselves from them. Which is understandable, but it's not for our best interests. So teachers sometimes, you know, they make their students do things that they don't really want. So they, sometimes they take them to the forest that is inhabited by the tigers or they take them to the haunted place or they make them face their different fears in one way or another. Sometimes. Maybe not every day, all the time, because that would be quite difficult, but at least sometimes we have to face challenges. So sometimes teachers will make you do that. And you one one teacher, he, he thought, well, nobody will go to stay in the graveyard to you know, look at their fear of ghosts. So he said, I'll go and do it to be an example. So off he went. And some of the monks went with him. And he, he said, anyone who is afraid can leave at any time. This is not you know, no one's forcing you to stay in the, in the graveyard, charnel ground. And he showed, he made sure they all knew the exit when they got there. You know, it's like a, a little piece of forest, very dense graveyards, charnel grounds in Thailand are always very dense forests because nobody likes to go there. They don't clear the forest. They just go there maybe for a, a cremation or bury a body and then they, everyone leaves as quickly as possible. They don't like to stay there. <laughs> so it was very overgrown. So the teacher made sure everyone knew the way out of the forest in case of panic. And this is quite common. 
monks will go into a charnel ground and panic. Maybe not in the daytime, but certainly at night, the chance of panic is quite high. So you have to know the way out. And that's his duty, the teacher's duty. So he set up his umbrella, you may a little umbrella tent and his little place to meditate and other monks set themselves up. And there's one monk that seems to be kind of one of those laws in every group of meditators. There's always somebody who sort of says, makes their announcement, you know, they're not scared, I can do it, I'm not scared, I'm going to stay here all night. There's always someone who makes that kind of declaration. And they always seem to be the one who <laughs> run into trouble. I don't know why. But anyway, this monk, he made this declaration. He said, I'm going to do it. We're going to stay here for a whole week. I think the teacher said, we're going to stay there for three days. But this monk said, I'm going to stay here for a whole week. I'm just going to get rid of all my fears. And everyone kind of rolls their eyes. And so, oh, yeah. <laughs> And the teacher said he knew this monk won't make it. As soon as he made this declaration, he knew he wouldn't make it. So maybe that's a good reason not to make declarations too easily or too quickly when you're practicing Dhamma. Anyway, he said it. And sure enough, in the (laughs) middle of the night, the guy panicked and he's running around the forest. And by dawn, he just picked up all his gear and he just fled the place (laughs) and never came back. He was too scared. Poor guy. But I guess you could say it's still good for trying. Sometimes we have to try. And it's difficult. Facing dukkha, pain, whether it's fear or physical pain or going without sometimes is another one, isn't it? All of these are like learning situations. It's where you actually tend to learn most about yourself. You know, if you don't like going on a hike and you make yourself go on a hike or you go and stay in a graveyard or sometimes just doing things where you push yourself a little bit more than you would like to, often you learn a lot because you're, if you're practicing mindfulness and awareness, you may see your dukkha, your suffering dissolve right before your eyes when you do this. Could be something, a very common one nowadays, public speaking. A lot of people that don't like to speak in public, give talks, lectures, explain things. They're kind of nervous. So monks as well, many monks never want to give a talk in their life. So Ajahn Chah is famous for putting monks on the high seat when they didn't want to go. You know, maybe they're just a, a junior monk. He'd put them on the high seat and say, give a talk to a hall full of hundreds of people. And all the fear would come up, nervous, what am I going to say, what are they going to think about me? All of these things we call this sense of self, the conceit, the pride, the ego, waiting to be crushed, (laughs) waiting to be embarrassed. I think statistically, probably more often than not, the monk did quite well and gave a reasonable talk and everyone quite liked it. I think generally that was the case, (laughs) from what I remember in the old days but you know there was the fear though was genuine the particularly before giving the talk there's the fear what will happen can i say anything so fear comes in many forms doesn't it you know, fear of being in awkward situations fear of the unknown it's not just fear of ghosts or fear of tigers it comes in many forms sometimes you just have to face it don't you in order to learn and to see it, see it through. And one of the reasons we don't like fear is accompanied by a feeling of tension, quite often in the body, so your physical tension. You know, This is something you have to notice. When you have fear, there's tension in your muscles, maybe your stomach <clears throat> gets tense. Some people, they, sort of, you know, they tighten their jaws, maybe they get a headache. All kinds of different pains around the body, but you get tension in the body. And then the mind can react in different ways, maybe just endless thinking. Thinking, 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 thinking. You know, how am I going to get out of here? What do I do? What do I do? Thoughts seem to speed up when you're afraid. Um, 
so it's you know a combination a lot of uncontrollable thoughts irrational thoughts weird thoughts <laughs> all kinds of thoughts coming up and you often at first you don't think there's anything you can do and then feelings feelings of tension feeling unpleasant feelings in the body but your aim is to try and establish awareness and watch what's going on so you know say you go and stay in a graveyard or a charnel ground all night well you get a long time to practice being with this it's a good situation once you're ready for it, yeah, you go and stay, well, <clears throat> the thought of ghosts approaching or you know, every sound, what is it, what is it, that can keep you going the whole night. But probably sooner or later, maybe dawn or maybe even before dawn comes, you know, you, you've seen enough fear coming and going, the thoughts associated with it, the emotions, the feelings that you already will half know but as as half the night is finished you'll know at least halfway that this fear is just temporary it comes and goes it changes it's, there's nothing reliable in it there's nothing real in it it's in what we say it's impermanent transient state of mind but you have to be willing to look at it you have to be willing to be establish mindfulness awareness be patient with all the feelings that come up and then just keep watching. In all my years as a monk, I don't think I've ever heard of a single monk being hurt by a ghost. Seriously hurt. No, don't think so. Certainly I've heard of monks being afraid of ghosts, seeing ghosts, yep, but not ever being actually physically harmed by a ghost. <laughs> And yet, you know, what's fear thinking? When the mind of fear is thinking, oh, what is this ghost going to do to me? Is it going to kill me or take me off somewhere or eat me alive or something? You know, that's what the imagination does. But these things have never happened, really. I mean, maybe they once happened in history. Who knows? But generally speaking, it doesn't happen. <laughs> more, more likely to be run over by a car on the road or something like that, far more people get you know even I do know monks who are being hit by cars <laughs> unfortunately sometimes you got Bindaba in Thailand and you know those cars they travel very fast and if a monk's not watching or the driver's not watching you can get hit by a car but I've never been I've never heard of a monk being hurt by a ghost <laughs> so you question it doesn't it fear mean needs needs investigation you have to question it. What is this fear? What's going on here? How realistic, how reasonable are my thoughts about whatever it is? And how much your imagination just fills in the story or creates the story in the first place and then fills in all the details. And nothing ever happens. Most of the time, nothing ever happens, does it? <laughs> That's something you have to be mindful from beginning through it to the end. And you say, look, nothing happened. And I was mindful. I was there. I was aware. I wasn't asleep because you probably couldn't sleep. If you're really afraid, you can't sleep. So you just practice mindfulness through the whole night, maybe. And you say, oh, fear arose and fear passed away. Then the next time you're in any situation, you know, fear of the doctor, fear of the dentist, fear of some bully, fear of ghosts, fear of anything, you can say, oh, I've been here before, I know this. Fear rises and passes away and your mind will be ever so stronger, it'll be much stronger than last time. One of the benefits of contemplating the, the dukkha of fear, the, the suffering of fear, is it makes your mind a little bolder, a little braver, a little more confident, self-confident, but based on true experience that you've seen thoughts of fear and emotions arise, pass away. Fear may still be an un unpleasant, ugly, kind of horrible situ uh, feeling that comes up. You know, it may return, but your attitude towards it may change slowly or quickly, depending on maybe how much you practice. 
That's the important thing. You know, dukkha doesn't overcoming dukkha doesn't mean to say you make the whole world trouble free, problem free, comfortable with no, no tigers and no ghosts and no nasty things around in the world that may prompt fear. Those, those things will still be there. But what overcoming dukkha means you change your attitude because you establish awareness and you see your emotional reactions of fear, the thoughts, the feelings are temporary. They come and go and the more clearly you see that, the less they can bother the mind. You know, when awareness is strong, you know, which is what we're doing as we practice meditation, there's a separation between the fear, the thought, the feeling, the object of your fear, the, the ghost or the tiger or whatever it may be, and the mind that knows. There's a separation, there's a sort of distance. So the fear is real, it's there as, a, as an emotion, as a mood, a feeling. But the mind that is aware is also real and it's the mind that is aware is kind of neutral, isn't it? We have what we call equanimity, detachment, when we're aware. It just knows. It's not saying it's good, not saying it's bad, like it, don't like it, it just knows. So the more you can develop that, then the the fear and it, all, all its kind of the package of fear, the feeling, the thoughts, the emotions, are seen as something that arises and passes away, something that comes up is real, but it doesn't last, and it's not really the same as the mind that just knows it. There's a distance. So, of course, fear doesn't like that. You know, fear thrives on attachment, believing it, kind of getting identifying with it and getting mixed up with it. As soon as your mind has a bit of equanimity from the awareness that you're developing the mindfulness, fear starts to fade. Immediately it will fade a bit and maybe sometimes completely fade. But it will immediately diminish because you're no longer buying into it and grasping at it. So what replaces fear? Peace. <laughs> Peace of mind that arises from seeing Dukkha, letting go of the causes of Dukkha, the, the grasping, the identification. You let go, so what fills the mind? Peace, wisdom, mindfulness, compassion, all the good qualities. So fear is weakened all the time and over, over time practicing it will bother you less. Doesn't mean to say the world will be free from fearful situations, it's just your mind will know how to deal with them better over time. And this is the same for any mental defilement rooted in greed, so you're talking about all the desires and attachments and addictions and lust and all the wantings we have. Delusions and confusions and worries and anxieties, you know, everything is the same kind of principle. Your aim is to establish awareness so that there's the, the mind that knows and then there's the mood or the thought and the feeling that is known. But then the mind that knows is not suffering and it knows it's not suffering. <laughs> you know, when you have awareness, mindfulness, you know you're not suffering. You're calm enough or stable enough to see whatever it is that you were attaching to. And it may be arising. So you have thoughts and feelings arising right now, but there's also awareness accompanying it. You say, ah, this is not me. Because there's a part of the mind that is separate, detached, you might say free or liberated. If you develop this part of the mind more and more and more, then the fears and the anxieties of life are going to get weaker and lesser and come up less often and not bother you so much. And if they do arise, they're not going to be so intense. So 
So the biggest problem is really just the fact we don't like to investigate dukkha. We don't like to learn the lessons we need to learn from suffering. Because we're so used to looking for ways out of suffering, in the easy way. And the world will provide that nowadays so much. You know, you can any kind of mental suffering, you can find some kind of way of getting away from it, distracting yourself, running away mentally from it. That you know, we permanently remain a bit ignorant unless we start confronting our own fears and attachments. So this is why the Buddha said, go and stay in that quiet place. You go into a quiet place in Australia, as everyone knows around the world, they all say, oh, Australia has so many poisonous snakes and spiders and crocodiles and sharks and <laughs> all these things that everyone is scared of. Well, it's true, they're here. You know, we live with them, we see them every year. Already the snakes are out this year, but you know, so far I haven't had any real problem. And you can use them for contemplation. You know, I don't like meeting snake. If I meet a snake on the path right next to me, I don't like it because I know it can kill me or possibly kill me. But I just contemplate the that fear. If it arises, I contemplate it and try not to do anything silly either. <laughs> Many years ago, we were visited by Lumpur Plian very great monk who lived in Thailand, a meditation master. And uh, he's always been associated with Nagas, the snake gods in Buddhism. And when he arrived, the day he arrived in the monastery, he was here for many days, I can't remember how long, five days, six days. The day he arrived, um, a really big fat snake called an eastern brown snake appeared at the gate of the monastery and coiled up right next to the gate. Not in the middle of the road, luckily, because <laughs> people came, a lot of people came to visit Lumbo Blian and they drive in, which would have squashed it. But on the side of the road, next to our front gate, this snake just arrived from where we don't know, just plumped himself there or herself. And for the next six days of his visit, just stayed there didn't move, strangely enough. And uh, everyone walked past and said, oh, I don't like walking into the gate because there's this brown snake there and they're very fast. If they get angry, they can quickly bite you and they're deadly. So everyone said they're on high alert because of this snake. It didn't do anything to anybody. It just coiled up and sat there sunbathing every day. But Everyone said, well, I don't like the snake, but it does make you very mindful. <laughs> That's what danger does, is not it? It makes you mindful. So we took Lumpur Plian down one day, because after a few days of seeing this snake, everyone was sort of saying, oh, this snake's not going anywhere. It's more like a kind of bodyguard for the monastery. <laughs> we thought, yeah, maybe Lumpur is here. It's bodyguard for the body, uh, for the monastery. So we went down to see it at the gate to say hello. We took Lumpur Plian to say hello to the snake. <laughs> that day, um, the telecommunications company that runs the phone lines around here, they came to do some work at the, by our front gate. They had an underground optic fiber cable which they dug up. They made a pit and dug up. And so they were digging with the machine and the snake just sat there while this machine was digging and then the machine stopped and the men had to dig by hand and we went down to see the snake and we talked to the men and they said mm, we were thinking we we're going to kill this snake because it's deadly and it's right here where we're working it's just a few meters away and we said no 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 you can't do that that's our snake <laughs> I said it's our pet snake so <laughs> which it sort of was um, when you buy the monastery or the monastery was offered the monastery land well, I guess you get the snakes with it I don't know how does it work? <laughs> anyway, I said, that's our snake. You can't kill it. And they said, well, what are we going to do? We're working here every day. And they're in their shirt sleeves. Or they'd even taken their shirts off. It was so hot. And they're digging and working there all day long. So I said, well, can you 
put something between you and the snake. So they, they made a little barrier with their tools and they stuck a, t a shovel right in the ground next to the snake so they didn't have to see it. They said, well, if I don't have to see it, I'll be okay. Because <laughs> seeing it meant they were too on edge to work. But when they stopped seeing it, because they made this barrier with their tools and they stuck a shovel, didn't have to see it, then they said they can carry on. So he said, ah, oh, good, okay. So they carried on, they didn't bother the snake, and the snake didn't bother them. And hundreds of people drove or walked past this snake over a period of days. Not a single person was bothered, except for one couple. Towards the end of Lumpur Pulian's stay, this couple came to the monastery and they parked their car at the fr outside the boundary of the monastery on the road. It's a bit unusual. Most people just drive in and park in the car park. They, dr they parked outside and then they walked in and they walked past this snake and the snake uncoiled itself and chased them away. <laughs> I don't know why, but this news went all around Warburton. They said, oh, went to see the Buddhist monastery and this this couple were not happy that they'd been chased by a snake. Um, so they never came back. So we don't know what they were up to or why, but anyway, the snake didn't like them, but hundreds of other people were fine. Perhaps it's karma. Yeah, karma has its reasons. <laughs> but the snake was a very good teacher. Everyone was on edge, everyone was alert. Oh, snake, have to be careful, have to be mindful. So dukkha is like that. Dukkha is your snake, your tiger snake, brown snake, cobra, whatever snakes you don't like. They're your teacher, aren't they? They, they make you see the dukkha of life, the attachments, the fears, the worries that come up. But that's where you can learn if you establish awareness. It could be pain in your body, the pain of illness, or aging, Injury can be, uh, sometimes it's karma pain, isn't it? Some people, they say they meditate, as soon as they start to meditate, they get pain in their chest. It's not that they have heart disease, but it's just a painful feeling comes up only when they meditate. It seems a very common one. What can they do? Well, meditate through it, establish awareness and know that there's a painful feeling and then there's a mind that knows it, but they're not the same thing. This is what awareness or mindfulness allows you to do, is to be able to contemplate or know experience, even painful experience, but without grasping at it as being you. You just know it. And the sense of suffering or dukkha fades away when, whenever you do that. When you're not very mindful, yeah, it's suffering. Painful feelings are suffering. So you have chest pain, it's suffering. Maybe if it's karma, you know, there's no health problem. Maybe it's just previous times you've hurt somebody and it's coming back to you. Or tension and suffering you've built up in a relationship with someone over some issue in your life. And so when you meditate, it will all your suffering gathers together in a knot in your chest. It's quite common. The only way through it is just meditate through it. Practice awareness until that pain starts to fade. And usually it does. I usually recommend people to meditate through it maybe many times, not just once, until it, it goes. And it does seem to fade, those kind of pains. If it's physical injury, where well, you just follow the doctor's orders, and maybe it will take a while. But still, you have to let go of your attachment to the pain and what you think about it. So you meditate through it, establish the awareness. Is this pain me, mine, myself or not? And when you're aware, you can see it's not really me, it's not a person. It's just one thing that the mind is knowing. Painful memories the painful things other people say, painful experiences, failures. You know, things go wrong, we make mistakes, we don't get what we want, we don't achieve what we want. Yeah, they're painful experiences, but establish awareness and it's just something you learn from and you move on. When there's no awareness, you grasp and you 
hold on to it and so it becomes a heavy weight pulling your mind down, doesn't it? Even small things, if you keep holding on to them, they just pull your mind down so you're forever suffering, unhappy. We do that with the past, don't we? Past mistakes, past unpleasant experiences. We tend to drag them around a bit like you're sort of pulling a, a rock behind you. <laughs> dragging the past with you because we're not willing to let go. Grudges, bad feeling with this person, that person. As soon as you start to practice some awareness, you might become aware of what you're doing and that's when you can let go. You say, oh, the suffering is in the grasping. The memory is just a memory. The suffering is in the grasping of that memory as me, myself, this problem I've got, my mistake, my suffering. I've been suffering for so long now, can't stand it anymore. <laughs> on and on we go, the complaining mind. But it could be anything, couldn't it? In, basically, if you establish awareness, you'll see all the stuff of the mind, all the thoughts, the random thoughts, the rubbish thoughts, the meaningless kind of thoughts, so much. But as you practice more mindfulness and awareness, you start to have a sense of spaciousness. It doesn't matter so much, it doesn't bother you so much because you're not identifying with every thought as you, yourself, or me, mine, myself. You're just knowing it and you see it arise, pass away, it doesn't bother you, like the flies, they just land on you and fly away again. It doesn't matter. You don't have to do anything much, just be aware. So it sounds very simple, just be aware, but that really is what we have to do if you want to overcome suffering. It's just make that awareness very strong, very continuous. That's why we need to keep practicing every day. Because our awareness is not yet strong, not yet continuous. But if we do put effort into developing it, there's a way out of suffering. The Buddha, Ajahn Chah, all the teachers, they've all proven that. So tonight maybe I'll leave you with these uh, reflections and if there's any questions, we can try and answer them afterwards.